This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, see LibriVox.org. Recording by Hugh McGuire. A Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne. Chapter 8 Serious Preparations for Vertical Descent. Altona, which is but a suburb of Hamburg, is the terminus of the Kiel Railway, which was to carry us to the belts. In twenty minutes we were in Holstein. At half-past six the carriage stopped at the station. My uncle's numerous packages, his voluminous impedimenta, were unloaded, removed, labeled, weighed, put in the luggage vans, and at seven we were seated face to face in our compartment. The whistle sounded, the engine started, we were off. Was I resigned? No, not yet. Yet the cool morning air and the scenes on the road rapidly changed by the swiftness of the train drew me away somewhat from my sad reflections. As for the professor's reflections, they went far in advance of the swiftest express. We were alone in the carriage, but we sat in silence. My uncle examined all his pockets and his traveling bag with the minutest care. I saw that he had not forgotten the smallest matter of detail. Amongst other documents, a sheet of paper carefully folded bore the heading of the Danish consulate with the signature of W. Christensen, consul at Hamburg and the professor's friend. With this we possessed the proper introductions to the governor of Iceland. I also observed the famous document most carefully laid up in a secret pocket in his portfolio. I bestowed a malediction upon it, and then proceeded to examine the country. It was a very long succession of uninteresting, loamy, and fertile flats, a very easy country for the construction of railways, and propitious for the laying down of these direct level lines so dear to railway companies. I had no time to get tired of the monotony, for in three hours we stopped at Kiel, close to the sea. The luggage, being labelled for Copenhagen, we had no occasion to look after it. Yet the professor watched every article with jealous vigilance, until all were safe on board. There they disappeared in the hold. My uncle, notwithstanding his hurry, had so well calculated the relations between the train and the steamer that we had a whole day to spare. The steamer, Eleonora, did not start until night. Then sprang a feverish state of excitement in which the impatient, irascible traveller devoted to perdition the railway directors and the steamboat companies and the governments which allowed such intolerable slowness. I was obliged to act chorus to him when he attacked the captain of the Eleonora upon this subject. The captain disposed of us summarily. At Kiel, as elsewhere, we must do something to while away the time. What with walking on the verdant shores of the bay within which nestles the little town, exploring thick woods which make it look like a nest embowered amongst thick foliage, admiring the villas, each provided with a little bathing-house, and moving about and grumbling. At last, ten o'clock came. The heavy coils of smoke from the Eleanor's funnel unrolled in the sky. The bridge shook with the quivering of the struggling steam. We were on board, and owners for the time of two berths, one over the other, in the only saloon cabin on board. At a quarter past the moorings were loosed, and the throbbing steamer pursued her way over the dark waters of the great belt. The night was dark. There was a sharp breeze and a rough sea. A few lights appeared on shore through the thick darkness. Later on, I cannot tell when, a dazzling light from some lighthouse threw a bright stream of fire along the waves, and this is all I can remember of this first portion of our sail. 
At seven in the morning we landed at Corsor, a small town on the west coast of Zealand. There we were transferred from the boat to another line of railway, which took us by just as flat a country as the plain of Holstein. Three hours travelling brought us to the capital of Denmark. My uncle had not shut his eyes all night. In his impatience, I believe, he was trying to accelerate the train with his feet. At last he discerned a stretch of sea. The sound, he cried. At our left was a huge building that looked like a hospital. That's a lunatic asylum, said one of our traveling companions. Very good, thought I. Just the place we want to end our days in. And great as it is, that asylum is not big enough to contain all Professor Liedenbrock's madness. At ten in the morning at last we set our feet in Copenhagen. The luggage was put upon a carriage and taken with ourselves to the Phoenix Hotel in Breda Gate. This took half an hour, for the station is out of town. Then my uncle, after a hasty toilet, dragged me after him. The porter at the hotel could speak German and English, but the professor, as a polygot, questioned him in good Danish and it was in the same language that the personage directed him to the Museum of Northern Antiquities. The curator of this curious establishment, in which wonders are gathered together, out of which the ancient history of the country might be reconstructed by means of its stone weapons, its cups, and its jewels, was a learned savant, the friend of the Danish consul at Hamburg, Professor Thomson. My uncle had a cordial letter of introduction to him. As a general rule, one savant greets another with coolness, but here the case was different. Mr. Thompson, like a good friend, gave the Professor Liedenbrock a cordial greeting, and he even vouchsafed the same kindness to his nephew. It is hardly necessary to say the secret was sacredly kept from the excellent curator. We were simply disinterested travellers visiting Iceland, out of harmless curiosity. Mr. Thompson placed his services at our disposal, and we visited the Keys with the object of finding out the next vessel to sail. I was yet in hopes that there would be no means of getting to Iceland, but there was no such luck. A small Danish schooner, the Valkyria, was to set sail for Reykjavik on the 2nd of June. The captain, Mr. Bjarn, was on board. His intending passenger was so joyful that he almost squeezed his hands till he ached. That good man was rather surprised at his energy. To him it seemed a very simple thing to go to Iceland, as that was his business. But to my uncle it was sublime. The worthy captain took advantage of his enthusiasm to charge double fares, but we did not trouble ourselves about mere trifles. "'You must be on board on Tuesday at seven in the morning,' said Captain Bjarn, after having pocketed more dollars than were his due. Then we thanked Mr. Thompson for his kindness, and we returned to the Phoenix Hotel. "'It's all right, it's all right,' my uncle repeated. "'How Fortunate we are to have found this boat ready for sailing. Now, let us have some breakfast and go about the town. We went first to Coggins Nightorb, an irregular square in which are two innocent-looking guns, which need not alarm anyone. Close by, at number five, there was a French restaurant kept by a cook of the name of Vincent, where we had an ample breakfast for four marks each. Then I took a childish pleasure in exploring the city. My uncle let me take him with me, but he took notice of nothing, neither the insignificant king's palace nor the pretty seventeenth-century bridge which spans the canal before the museum, nor that immense cenotaph of Torvaldsens, adorned with horrible mural painting and containing within it a collection of the sculptor's works, nor in a fine park the toy-like chateau of Rosenberg, nor the beautiful Renaissance edifice of the exchange, nor its spire composed of the twisted tails of four bronze dragons, nor the great windmill on the ramparts, 
whose huge arm dialed in the sea breeze like the sails of a ship. What delicious walks we should have had together, my pretty Virlandaise and I, along the harbour where the two deckers and the frigates slept peaceably by the red roofing of the warehouse, by the green banks of the strait, through the deep shades of the trees amongst which the fort is half concealed, where the guns are thrusting out their black throats between branches of alder and willow. But alas, Grauben was far away, and I never hoped to see her again. But if my uncle felt no attraction towards these romantic scenes, he was very much struck with the aspect of a certain church spire situated in the island of Amak which forms the southwest quarter of Copenhagen. I was ordered to direct my feet that way. I embarked on a small steamer which piles on the canals, and in a few minutes she touched the quay of the dockyard. After crossing a few narrow streets where some convicts in trousers half yellow and half grey were at work under the orders of the gangers, we arrived at the Vor Frelsers Kirk, there was nothing remarkable about the church, but there was a reason why its tall spire had attracted the professor's attention. Starting from the top of the tower, an external staircase wound around the spire, the spirals circling up into the sky. Let us get to the top, said my uncle. I shall be dizzy, I said. The more reason why we should go up, we must get used to it. But come, I tell you, don't waste our time. I had to obey. A keeper who lived at the other end of the street handed us the key, and the ascent began. My uncle went ahead with a light step. I followed him not without alarm, for my head was very apt to feel dizzy. I possessed neither the equilibrium of an eagle nor his fearless nature. As long as we were protected on the inside of the winding staircase up the tower, all was well enough. But after toiling up a hundred and fifty steps, the fresh air came to salute my face, and we were on the leads of the tower. There the aerial staircase began its gyrations, only guarded by a thin iron rail, and the narrowing steps seemed to ascend into infinite space. Never shall I be able to do it, I said. Don't be a coward. Come up, sir, said my uncle with the coldest cruelty. I had to follow, clutching at every step. The keen air made me giddy. I felt the spire rocking with every gust of wind. My knees began to fail. Soon I was crawling on my knees, then creeping on my stomach. I closed my eyes. I seemed to be lost in space. At last I reached the apex with the assistance of my uncle dragging me up by the collar. Look down, he cried, look down well. You must take a lesson in abysses. I opened my eyes. I saw houses squashed flat as if they had all fallen down from the skies. A smoke fog seemed to drown them. Over my head ragged clouds were drifting past, and by an optical inversion they seemed stationary, while the steeple, the ball, and I were all spinning along with fantastic speed. Far away on one side was the green country. On the other the sea sparkled, bathed in sunlight. The sound stretched away to Elsinore, dotted with a few white sails, like seagulls' wings, and in the misty east and away to the northeast lay outstretched the faintly shadowed shores of Sweden. All this immensity of space whirled and wavered, fluctuating beneath my eyes. But I was compelled to rise, to stand up, to look. My first lesson in dizziness lasted an hour. When I got permission to come down and feel the solid street pavements, I was afflicted with severe lumbargo. Tomorrow we will do it again, said the professor. And it was so. 
For five days in succession I was obliged to undergo this anti-vertiginous exercise, and whether I would or not, I made some improvement in the art of lofty contemplations. End of chapter 8